the original title was something about Paul and philosophy, and uh, that marginally relates to what we're going to talk about today. Um, but really, what I want to talk a little bit about is reading Paul in context. So consider this as like a bit of an application of what you did last week, which I wasn't here for, so I can only imagine based on looking at the slides that Zach stole from me to make the presentation last week. Uh, but you could also consider this to be some semi-informed ram ramblings of somebody who doesn't really know anything about any of this. So just take it all with a grain of salt. Um, what I really want to do is kind of just talk about stuff. And uh, so don't let me like talk for 30 minutes without interacting. Um, this was originally supposed to be like 25 slides with like lots of questions and discussion. Uh, and then as I was putting the slides together, it became like 60 slides. So I may skip some of them uh, in an effort to actually talk with you guys a little more. OK, so <clears throat> almost everything, but not everything that I say is coming from various sources from NT Wright. Um, so in those cases where I say something interesting, it's probably because I'm saying something that he said. In the case where I say something stupid, it's probably because I either am making it up myself or because I copied it from some random spot on the internet and it's wrong. So again, take it with a grain of salt. Um, some of the, the kind of sources uh, for some of the thoughts we're going to talk about uh, would be Paul and the Faithfulness of God um, from N.T. Wright, which is uh, one of his scholarly works. and so. A variety of the things we'll talk about are coming from there. Um, but he also has a more popular level book called Paul, A Biography, which is very good if you just want to read about Paul and kind of in a biographical format, uh, go through like all the things that happened in his life and what he's doing. Um, it's, it's a very good book as well. I also uh, reference maybe a little bit one of his other books uh, that's brand new called Into the Heart of Romans. Again, related to Paul. And then you'll see I stole some slides from Zach, which are ripped off of uh, C. John Collins's uh, book as well. So danger scale. There shouldn't really be any prior knowledge of anything required for this today, uh, other than like basic understanding of what Christianity is and having grown up in a world where you're exposed to some extent to Paul. Um, so we, we shouldn't ha be having any melting brains today unless something goes horribly wrong. Uh, but to kind of get started, <clears throat> I want to make some touch points with what Zach talked about last week. Um, so remember, when we're talking about understanding a text, right? Something that somebody has written in the past, understanding communication, you have this idea of that shared cognitive environment, right? And if you don't understand that cognitive environment, the context surrounding what's being written, uh, you're going to wind up misunderstanding what you know, is trying to be conveyed in the text. Now, last week was focused a lot on the Old Testament. It's maybe more serious in the Old Testament because it's even more foreign than Paul's world. But even still, there's a lot going on in Paul that is highly contextual, especially when you're talking about the epistles because he's not just writing something with the expectation that somebody is going to read it with no background. He's writing into a context, which can be confusing. So... To just kind of reiterate some of the points that Zach made, the Bible is not a self-contained work. Uh, it's written communication. It leaves a lot of things implicit. So that's going to be a lot of what we're talking about is what is Paul interacting with in his wider world and how can that help you understand the nuances of what he's trying to do. Um, understand that cognitive environment that you're trying to, you're trying to put yourself into the world of the author so that you can understand what things they're assuming. Um, in order to do that, we need to look at comparative literature. So we're going to do a little bit of that as well uh, as talking about other types of evidence uh, for different things. This is one of my favorite uh, diagrams here. This is stolen directly from C. John Collins's book. But it's the, this idea of that shared world, that the author is assuming 
that you share that understanding with him, right? Paul is assuming this, which is why it's difficult when he's writing to, you know, a specific church because his shared world is not just the general world. It's also the specific things that are going on in that church. Uh, so you can think about all these different things we talked about, um, literary form, genre, style, register, etc. And obviously when we're talking about Paul, we're, we're talking about epistles and there's a couple different categories. Um, and so we'll, we'll get in that in a second. But before we dive in, I have a fun exercise for you guys to do. So if you want to like pair off with the person next to you, we're going we're gonna to play a bit of a game. I'm going to give you a verse on the screen, and I want you to identify what it is. No Googling. That's verboten. No Googling. Uh, and just once you decide what you think it is, like write it down on your phone or something. Just make a note of it. And we're going to do four of these. And then once we go through four of them, we're going to talk about them. So this is the first one. Where did, does this come from? No Googling. So think about it. Talk amongst yourselves. Write it down somewhere. And then we'll take... Uh, so the, these may possibly be idiosyncratic translations. Uh, so, yeah, just we'll get there. hard. Okay, does everybody have a guess? Okay, next one. No, we're going to go through all four and then we're going to talk about the answers. It'll make sense eventually. Again, I will not vouch for the specific translations that may have been chosen. I will also say N.T. Wright retranslates. Whenever he quotes scripture, he just translates it himself. So you're always guaranteed to have a translation you've never heard before whenever you read anything in his book. Everybody have a guess? Okay, that's number two. Here's number three. This one's kind of long. I had to make the font smaller. I would point out that Philemon is only like 12 sentences long, right? If even. <laughs> like it fits on a note card. <laughs> okay, you guys you got a guess for the, four, the third one? No? Are you going to find a guess in your brain between now and the next 10 seconds? Okay, next one. Last one. I love the amount of consternation. <laughs> 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 
Okay, what do you guys think? Okay, so let's go through them in order. So who has a guess for this one? Does somebody, who can actually tell me the actual reference? Okay, that's half of the reference. What's, anybody know the actual verse? Yeah. Hmm. That's true. So are chapters in books sometimes. Uh, yeah, this is Romans 9.19. So very, very, uh, this should be a pretty recognizable uh, verse for, for you guys. What about this one? Mm. Okay, we have a, we have a, uh, this isn't Paul. Julie knows? Nope. But does it, what, does it sound like Paul? Mm -hmm. I mean, we. I mean, we basically these two verses start the same way, right? So this is, as some of you have guessed, not Paul. This is actually Epictetus, who is a rough contemporary of Paul, slightly, uh, slightly kind of younger than Paul. Um, what do you see? But when you're looking at those two, what, what jumps out at you? There's great similarities, right? And when you read Paul, like we all have probably all read Paul and probably rarely, if ever, read Epictetus, right? So we don't, re we don't catch what is stylistically unique to Paul. And this is still kind of unique. I mean, this is, Paul and Epictetus are kind of like the people who write this way. But um, at a little lesser degree, there's lots of other people that use these kind of styles. So how might that change your understanding of Paul when you recognize that he's like fitting within a style, a genre, instead of thinking about the way what Paul is doing is just, it's just Paul. Like, there's nothing to compare it to. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? You, you might find different flavors of understanding. Now, let, let's look at the, the next one. So what is this? Uh-oh. It is nothingness. There we go. So I heard Philemon. This is most of the primary section of the, the book of Philemon. Some chunks cut out to make it fit. What is this? This is very, very similar, but this is not Paul. This is uh, Pliny, actually. So again, there's a little bit of editing here to make it not quite so obvious. Um, but the point is, if you look at Philemon, you look at this letter from Pliny, they're similar in structure. Similar thing is going on where there's a person, uh, a servant of you know, a wealthy person is coming to, uh, in the one case, Pliny, in the one place, uh, in the other, the other case, Paul, and saying, you know, please advocate for me uh, to my, my master, the, the person that I'm supposed to be serving. And now think about some of the phrases in here. These are things you could imagine Paul saying, right? Pliny, though, has a worldview that is radically different from Paul's, right? When you understand, though, what is kind of the structure like of this thing, this is like a way of doing things in the ancient world, right? This, this is, Philemon is not a weird, unusual uh, exchange. What's unique is not that Paul is writing on behalf of Onesimus. What's weird is some of the things that Paul is saying. If you actually read the, the next sentence on this, he basically says, you know, uh, this is Pliny, says like, you know, take him back and, you know, if, if he doesn't do what you want him to do, just punish him really bad. Or, you know, he's, he's, he's not changing the status quo. He just said, 
let him let him come back. He's sorry, and if he does it again, you can you know you can have him executed or whatever. But what does Paul say? Paul actually radically undermines the the genre of this literature, because what Paul says is basically accept him as a brother, as an equal. Right? He's a slave. He's run away, but accept him. And I think I include. Did I include that in here? Yeah, that is very significant. You know, if we, if we don't understand the kind of structure of this letter, we may get fixated on the broader story of what this letter is and why it's being written and miss like, the kind of radical undermining of this type of activity that Paul is doing. And it's amazing that we have an example right here, of basically the same thing happening, and Pliny definitely doesn't do that, right? And, and the guy in, in the case of Pliny isn't even a slave. He's just like a, a free servant sort of person. Okay, so that's just a taste of ways you can think about this, how, how understanding the cognitive environment of, the, uh, of Paul can help you think a little bit differently about what he's writing. Because there is context. A, a lot of the things he's doing are not new, and a lot of them are new. And unless you know what other people are doing, you don't know which things are new and which things aren't. And it's the new, it's the unusual that's actually important, right? Those are the things that Paul's wanting his readers to, to, to find. When he says something that everybody else says, he knows that nobody's going to pay attention to that. But when he says something that's importantly different from what everybody else says. That's, that's what he's trying to emphasize. So I think you could say that Paul inhabits different worlds. Do you guys agree with that? What sort of worlds does he inhabit? Yeah, so the, the Roman Empire. Jewish. Obviously, he's a Jew, a, a devout Jew. Yeah, the, the Hellenistic world, right? So he's inhabiting these different spheres. Um, and that means that what he's, his writing is really complicated. Because there's all these different overlapping contexts, right? And importantly, too, he's, he's also writing to audiences that are in these different categories. So it's one thing, if he were just writing to Jews, then he probably would have different reference in a lot of the things that he's talking about. Uh, but he's writing to Gentiles, but also to Jews. Like, if you read Romans, Romans is like almost all about Jews and Gentiles and like how to be unified and why are there Jews and Gentiles and why aren't the Gentiles becoming Jews? And like, that's what Romans is about fundamentally. Um, so understanding those different worlds that are overlapping is really important. Um, so... Brief little outline here. This was Paul's life. Uh, take it with a grain of salt. I didn't actually double check all of the orders of these, and there are debates on some of the uh, sequences of events with Paul. Um, but roughly, you can see, you know, generally speaking, uh, kind of the, the path he took. Most importantly, though, is to understand he was born in Tarsus, and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, he studied in Jerusalem as a Pharisee, and then he, he kind of functioned in some, uh, some kind of official capacity uh, as a Pharisee for a while. Uh, and then on the road to Damascus, he changed in some way to, um, to incorporate Jesus into his Jewish faith. Um, and then uh, after there, he wound up in Jerusalem a couple times. He went on his, his journeys, uh, again, kind of mostly in the, the area of um, Turkey, Greece, um, over to Rome, and uh, ultimately was imprisoned by Nero and presumably executed uh, in uh, you know, the 60s-ish, um, which would have been after the Jewish War, right? Or during the beginning of the Jewish Wars? 70, 70 destroyed. When did it start? When did the Jewish war start? 
It was around, it was approximately at the time of the Jewish war. Okay, so this is Tarsus over there on the end, and kind of right uh, by Syria there. Uh, so Tarsus was a pretty important city in the, uh, the ancient world. Uh, it is one of the longest inhabited cities in the world, um, going back to the Neolithic period at least. Um, and it was an important city in almost every empire uh, of, of ancient history, with the exception of like Egypt. Uh, it was actually, I think, even the capital of the Assyrian Empire at one point. Um, so there's a lot of historical importance uh, uh, to Tarsus. A lot of things happened there. Um, and uh, importantly, it was a, an important trade city. It was very wealthy at various times. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the consequences of that and why that's important for understanding Paul here in a little bit. Um, also, note that we mentioned that Paul goes to Jerusalem and he studies, uh, Acts uh, says, at the feet of Gamaliel. Uh, and so, just kind of an aside on this, this is super interesting. How many of you guys know, are familiar with the, the Hillelite and uh, Shammahite uh, kind of discussions, the controversies, debates, whatever you'd call that? Only one. Two, maybe. Okay, so in the first century, uh, there were kind of two schools uh, of uh, the Pharisees. And the uh, Shammahites and the Hillelites were kind of, you could say, like a liberal and conservative type of a dichotomy, uh, where the Hillelites tend to be more tolerant, a little bit more flexible uh, in their interpretations of things, um, more tolerant of uh, Gentiles and um, not so militant, whereas the Shamaites were the kind of militants. Uh, the zealots tended to support the Shamaites. Um, they really bought into that uh, tradition of zeal for Torah. Um, and at the, in the first century, they were the stronger party. Um, and they kind of took the day uh, through the Jewish war and then through the, the Bar Kokhba uh, revolution. But then they died out. Uh, because they basically destroyed themselves in revolutions. Um, and so the Hillelites kind of ultimately won out in terms of um, the way the Jewish faith would progress. But um, the reason that I think this is interesting and worth pointing out that Acts specifically says that he's kind of studying with Gamaliel, uh, but actually Saul is very... Paul, Saul, is very clearly a Shamite. Like, he is absolutely down to go kill some heretics, uh, you know, maybe kill some Roman soldiers. Like, that's his jam, right? He wants to have, uh, you know, this Torah intensification, militant uprising, overthrow Rome, conquer the world, uh, you know, kill the non-believers sort of thing, right? Uh, so it's just an interesting tension in Acts that, it specifically mentions him studying in this, in this context. Uh, but I think uh, the way Wright discusses this is that um, while these are two factions, that they were moderately friendly to each other at various points in time. So, um, but ju just kind of an interesting dichotomy. Because if, if you're not even familiar with this debate, you wouldn't recognize that this is even an interesting thing. But Gamaliel is like the famous... Uh, Hillelite of the time, of the time period. He was literally the grandson of Hillel. So, yeah, to just kind of contextualize Paul, this is his tradition, as far as he tells us. That, that's the way he describes it. Okay, brief note here, just kind of an FYI. When we're talking about Paul, um, you know, these are the books that have at times been attributed to Paul. In uh, basically all corners of the scholarly world, regardless of your religious persuasions, everybody agrees that Hebrews, not, Hebrews is not written by Paul. If you're kind of more traditional, conservative, pretty much all uh, evangelical type scholars are going to accept um, most of these books. Uh, but there are, the, uh, there are debated and contested uh, 
uh, books, letters in the Pauline corpus. Um, so if you're going to engage with secular scholarship at all, when possible, uh, you want to support your arguments with the undi undisputed letters. Uh, so if you read Wright's book, he does this a lot. And in his introduction, he discusses it. Uh, he doesn't restrict himself to the undisputed books, but he specifically makes an effort to um, let the undisputed books being the load, the load bearing uh, arguments in most cases, even though he obviously accepts um, all of the letters as authentic, uh, authentic, obviously not Hebrews because that definitely wasn't written by Paul. Um, so just something to be aware of. This is probably most relevant for Ephesians. Um, I mean, uh, you know, that's probably, I think, the most important one. But the seven undisputed letters, most importantly, contain both uh, Romans and uh, 1 Corinthians, which are pretty significant. You can get a lot just from those two. I would also point out that, uh, how many of you know, how are the epistles ordered in the New Testament? Zachary knows. Two other people know. Somebody yell it out. Length. So what's the longest one? What's the second longest one? Yeah, so... Uh, yes, true. They put them next. Okay. But the point being that you can make really good arguments from some of the, the longest and most uh, kind of important books, uh, letters of Paul, and those are not disputed. So, I mean, how many times are you making a theological argument from, like, I don't know, Titus, right? Not often. Um, you're probably talking about Romans and 1 Corinthians and you know, maybe Ephesians or something. Okay, so let's talk about Paul and philosophy, which was originally the original whole purpose of this talk, but... Uh, it's kind of a side quest now. Uh, so we have, I have kind of two sets of things I want to talk about. So this is the first one, which is Paul and his relationship and use of philosophy. So it's a kind of interesting way of thinking about how Paul is engaging in his intellectual environment. Uh, once we do that, then we're going to talk about um, how Paul is relating to the Roman world in certain ways, which is also interesting. Uh, like I said, I have like a billion slides, so I might skip through the, some of these kind of quickly. Um, but we'll try to get to the, the core of this. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Where was the center of philosophy in the ancient world? In the, the Roman world. In Athens. Okay. For most of the history, that was true. Except for one brief little time where Athens decided to like fight against Rome, and then they got sacked and conquered, and they weren't so much philosophy when they were on fire, uh, which is what this picture is. So Athens was definitely the center of philosophy. Um, uh, 75, 80, I guess 85 years before Christ, uh, there was a, uh, a war, basically, where um, the Romans were fighting with these people in Turkey, and basically the, the Athenians... Um, their philosopher kings decided to support uh, that king against Rome, and it was a terrible idea, and they, they were conquered. The consequence of this, though, was that anybody with the means fled Athens, uh, so you kind of have an intellectual diaspora, and some of those philosophers fled to Tarsus. Um, one of the consequences of this is that by the time uh, you, you're in the first century, Tarsus is maybe the second city in the, the Roman Empire for philosophy, specifically Stoic philosophy. Um, so Tarsus was not at all a backwater. This was like the seat of the Roman Empire in Turkey. Um, emperors visited there. Uh, Alexander the Great visited there, um, spent time there. But um, it was very important. It was very wealthy. Uh, Julius Caesar exempted it from taxes, and it was actually the Jews in the area of Tarsus that negotiated their kind of religious freedom, their exemption from having to worship the emperor um, in, uh, in, in the Roman Empire. And, and that becomes really important for the later Christians, because the Christians are kind of like squeezing their way under the Jewish exemption so that they're not having to worship Caesar. 
Um, so this picture here is actually a picture of a, the Roman road uh, that has been excavated in Tarsus. This may actually be uh, the road, one of the roads that Augustus had built when he became emperor. Um, so he ordered a lot of the construction projects. Uh, again, because of the nature of this city, when Rome defeated uh, the, not just the Athenians, but the, the uh, Cilicians who were uh, the Cilician pirates that they were warring against, they basically sent a bunch of them to the area, the region around Tarsus. And so uh, Tarsus became a very diverse city. It was, had many different kind of religious practices. Mithraism uh, was kind of centered there. Um, and uh, again, around the time of Paul, uh, Strabo wrote this of Tarsus, uh, that the people of Tarsus have devoted themselves so eagerly not only to philosophy, but the whole round of education that they have surpassed even Athens, Alexandria, and any other place that could be named where there have been schools and lectures of philosophers. The point of all of this being that Paul wasn't just growing up in some backwater in the Roman Empire. This was, again, one of the intellectual centers of the empire. So the question becomes, OK, is Paul a philosopher? How does, how does he fit into these molds? Um, and then, of course, some people have charged Paul with being a Stoic. Right, and that you know, we don't understand what Paul's saying because we, we don't interpret him as a Stoic. Um, so on the one hand, you could say, okay, given that Paul was a Pharisee, like they weren't too into like interacting with Gentiles and uh, like engaging in those ideas and sharing thoughts and things like that. So on the, on the one hand, that might weigh against uh, the, the idea of Paul kind of being engaged in this environment. On the other hand, in Paul's actual writings, he does interact a lot with philosophical thought in various ways. But, but in what ways? Like, what, do, what does that look like and what does it mean? So, uh, I will say there's like an entire discussion that Wright goes into at this point, which I am not really going to get into. Uh, but there is, on the right side of the slide here, it's an, an interesting just kind of FYI. When we talk about philosophy, politics, and religion in the ancient world, these do not mean the same thing that they mean in 21st century American English. Like, not even remotely the same. Uh, in fact, all three of those things overlap a huge degree. What we call religion well, what, what they called religion would include things that we would say are philosophy or politics. The, like, it's just completely kind of mishmashed. Um, Im importantly, religion is this idea of like this personal faith that's kind of separate from other things in the world is definitely not at all what uh, religion is in the Roman world. Religion is a public uh, kind of community-oriented thing. It's sacrificing at the temple. It's praying to Caesar. It's engaging in these public events and festivals. It's not a personal belief thing. It is a community membership thing. So it's, it's just a different, it's a different world. Um, that's just an aside. There's like an, in the middle of this discussion, there's like a huge section in right on this. But importantly, Talking about philosophy, there's a couple of different things that uh, kind of ways that we can describe Paul as interacting with philosophy. We could describe it as confrontation. We could des describe adaptation uh, and maybe even derivation. So what do you think those might look like? When we're talking about confrontation, can you think of an example where Paul may be engaging in something uh, that would be akin to a confrontation of the philosophical or religious ideals of the Roman Empire? Greatest Diana of the Ephesians. Mm -hmm. it seems like that might be kind of causing a riot. Yeah. About their kind of Roman Do you know why? Why, why are they rioting? They're going to lose money. Yeah, so this is a really good example of this like religion, philosophy, politics thing all being intertwined. Because it was like the silversmiths that are starting this riot because they're afraid that people are going to buy less of their little uh, statue things, right? And so they start a riot. 
that is ultimately just a financial thing, but it gets clothed in political language, right? Because they're saying that uh, what, they're, what they're accusing Paul of is engaging in uh, kind of some kind of subversive activity to the, to the Roman authorities. So it gets, it's, it gets kind of twisted, right? So that's definitely confrontational. Any other examples of confrontation? Yeah, so we don't know exactly what he said to the philosophers in the marketplace, but we know it was enough that he got dragged before the high court in the Areopagus. <laughs> like, like basically, Supreme Court time, go to the Supreme Court now and we'll decide like maybe if you should be executed. It doesn't really give us any, exam any details of like why. So there was confrontation there. And if you read what he's saying in the Areopagus, uh, it's confrontational too, but it's also very nuanced. And I have that later in the slides, I think. What about adaptation? Can you think of any examples of adaptation? Yeah, maybe that's an adaptation of something from somewhere else. Possibly. I mean, some of it is definitely um, a little bit philosophical that he might have picked up. There's a part in Acts where he starts quoting um, Greek philosophers, like your own philosophers and poets, Epictetus, I think, in Acts 17. The in whom we live and move and have our being. Yeah. So he, he does quote, he quotes poets too. <laughs> so there, there's definitely some adaptation in there. What about derivation, right? This is the actual, um, this is the claim that ultimately gets leveled, the accusation that get level, gets leveled against Paul. He's not actually having any original thoughts. He's just parroting Stoic philosophy. So I stole another one of Zach's slides just to remind you. Uh, just because you're getting to a similar place does not mean it's coming through similar means. And really, they're not, like Paul is not at all getting to the same place as Stoic philosophy. We'll talk about that in a second. But there are some similarities. But remember, where did Paul grow up? In Tarsus. We don't know exactly when he lived there. He lived there at least two different periods. When he was younger and a little bit older. But the point is, he understood, I mean, he was an intellectual, right? Presumably, you know, aside from his tent making, he was probably interacting with people who, who had these stoic ideals, right? So, a little bit of a uh, kind of roadmap here. So, this is Paul, this red box, approximately, uh, is Paul's life. You can see some of the different... Uh, philosophers that are uh, kind of around this time. So he overlaps very strongly with Seneca, who is a, a Stoic. All of those kind of blue-purple ones are Stoics. So you can see Seneca and then Epictetus, who we had the quote from, and then Marcus Aurelius, uh, who is actually an emperor, emperor who is a Stoic. Um, and then there's some others. Um, but the, the Stoics are really the ones we want to talk about. Now, there's kind of two major philosophic schools. I mean, there's really like five, but uh, these are the two that are kind of relevant at this time period. And uh, so that's the Epicureans. Importantly, uh, it, it's interesting to talk about the Epicureans because their beliefs, metaphysical dualism, that gods are detached from the world and they live this kind of blissful life kind of somewhere else. They don't really care and they don't really interact with the world, almost kind of deistic. Um, so the best thing we should do is kind of de become detached from the world and uh, just like be happy and like buy things for ourselves. And I mean, that's a little bit of an uh, unfair comment. But uh, they're also atomists. So they're, they're, uh, they're basically materialists. Even the gods are made of atoms, right? So they're just, the gods are just these other beings that are over there somewhere in another, uh, an alternate physical realm. Um, there's no life after death. That's how they kind of solve the problem of, of death. Uh, and uh, pleasure is good. Pain is ba bad. Not just hedonism. I mean, it's more sophisticated than that. Uh, but ultimately, this is kind of their worldview. And the thing that's interesting about this is that uh, 
you know, obviously this doesn't work if you're a slave, right? You don't have the ability to like make yourself happy. But um, this is also much closer to the, the kind of default position of, of people in the world today than Stoicism is. But Stoicism, which we'll talk about next, is the default position in Paul's world. Um, so importantly, Paul, it, Luke explicitly reports that Paul goes to Athens and in the marketplace he talks with the Stoics and the Epicureans. Um, he probably didn't interact with Epicureans many other times than that, though, because the Epicureans weren't very popular, and Paul was not really, in general, talking to the uber-wealthy. He was talking to ordinary people who were more kind of uh, line kind of Stoics in terms of their beliefs. Uh, so difference with the Stoics, uh, the Stoics, um, this would have been the def default position. They're pantheists. So really, the divine is in everything, and we, they talk about these gods in kind of an inconsistent way, but ultimately there's just one god, and that god is in everything, and, uh, you know, monotheism, pantheism, right? Um, so there's kind of an extreme imminence in that, and that the divine is everywhere and is everything. Uh, this has some uh, consequences. Everything is physical, everything is corporeal, so it's not like there's this mystical, non-physical God, like the divine is somehow in the, in the corporeality of the universe. Uh, there's these, uh, this idea of the logos being the like, uh, active principle in all things. Uh, obviously people, but, but other things as well. Uh, but it is corporeal in some way, as is spirit or pneuma. Um, one of the, the, the kind of key ethical ideas here is this idea of like being indifferent to the circumstances you, are, you have in life. Uh, this is why this was an attractive philosophy for the slave, but also for the emperor. And within a generation or two, you had Epictetus, who was a formal, former slave, as one of the great Stoic teachers. A couple generations later, you have Marcus Aurelius, who's literally the em emperor of Rome. Um, both you know, important Stoic, Stoic thinkers. Importantly, though, nothing can be seriously wrong with the world because everything is divine. So deal with it or commit suicide, in a paraphrasation of what Epictetus would say, uh, literally what he would say. Uh, but also history is cyclical. There is no progression. It just things repeat over and over and over again. Now, so remember, we just said Paul went to the marketplace. He argued with uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics. That got him dragged in front of the court of Athens. Uh, and then he starts defending himself. And how does he do that? This is why this is interesting, because I think most of the times I've heard people talk about this passage, the presumption is that he's still just kind of like chatting with people or like having debates with people. Not like, OK, he's at the high court after having just riled up some trouble in the marketplace. So why is he going through what he's going through? What he's doing is saying, how, he's defending himself against the claim that he's you know, probably uh, proselytizing for some foreign deity or something like that. Um, and so understanding that makes you understand that passage a little bit more. Um, that's why he's talking about to the unknown God. He's trying to say, no, the, the real God, the one true God, is not a new foreign deity. This is what you yourselves uh, are recognizing exists. Now, how is Paul different from Stoicism? Again, some people will charge Paul with being a Stoic. But there are really critical, fundamental, central differences. Don't read that. What do you think? What, are some of, what makes Paul not a Stoic? Just from the few kind of bullet points we talk about Stoicism. <laughs> Just reading the slides, cheater. Mm -hmm. So where does this where does this come from this this linear history that Paul has? Did he invent that? This is like a fundamentally Jewish idea of a salvation history, that like history is marching forward towards a goal. Uh, 
and that there's a, you know, a, a sovereign God who's overseeing that. And this is central to Paul. Like, you can't ignore that, like, fundamental element in everything Paul is saying. Like, there, there is no cyclical thing. Like, there is a trajectory, right? I mean, that's everything that it was to be a Pharisee, and that's everything it is to be Paul. If he was a Stoic, yeah, that would not make any sense at all. Be like, be a slave, be a good slave, or you can commit suicide. I mean, there are some times when it seems like he is having that sort of attitude with things occasionally. Like when you mm-hmm. write to the church, it's like, slaves, just obey your masters, and you know, people follow your governing authorities. Uh, well, there's Go definitely on. a similarity, right? And like, he's definitely taking that idea of, of, that like you shouldn't be controlled by your circumstances. Like Paul would certainly agree with that, right? And that's why you, you know you can say like there is some of that. What was the word we used? This uh, how far back do I have to go? This adaptation, right? D- does Paul say anything about that idea of adaptation in any of his letters? Somebody want to throw out a paraphrasation? What? That's one. So yeah, to, to to Jews I become a Jew. To Greek to uh, to the Greek I become a Greek. You have heard it said he's interacting with the idea that we're already familiar with. Sure, but there's another one that I can think of, maybe two others that where he's very explicitly describing this idea of a- adapting and using, like take every thought captive. Right? So there's a variety of places where he, he references this. Okay, where was I? Um, so yeah, Paul, obviously not a pantheist. He's a monotheist, kind of a complicated and confusing monotheist because Trinity, but uh, he's definitely not a pantheist. Now, you can still see, though, he talks about the spirit. He talks about indwelling, right? So there, there, is, a, there is a similar language that he's borrowing, Probably intentionally. Remember, he's probably preaching mostly to Gentiles who have this Stoic understanding. So he's using the language of Stoicism, which is kind of complicated. Um, Perhaps the most important thing, though, is that the world is not divine. The, The world is not evil in the way that, like, a Manichaean dualist would think so, right? Like, it's it's not, or like a uh, I don't know, maybe Neoplatonist, right? It's, it's not like you're trying to escape the physical world, but the physical wor- world is also not perfect, right? It's tainted with sin, um, and God is redeeming the, the world, right? Not just man, but he's redeeming the world, um, all of creation. And that's definitely not at all what the Stoics believed, right? Uh, so again, Paul is not really very Stoic, but there are these really interesting similarities, especially in the ethical teaching, in terms of the way he phrases things and some of the ways he thinks about things. Um, So here's another uh, quotation from Epictetus, which is super interesting. Here's one from Marcus Aurelius. Uh, Again, this one's interesting to me, actually, for unrelated uh, reasons, just because you can see a lot of really important Greek terms uh, that we have imbued like deep Christian theology into that are ordinary Greek words that Paul's, uh, Paul's readers wouldn't read them any differently necessarily up front than if they were reading Marcus Aurelius or something, right? I mean, it's like 200 years later, but you get the idea. Um, but lastly, Paul, uh, these are the things you should, should think through. Whatever is true, whatever is holy, whatever is upright, uh, whatever is attractive, whatever is you know virtuous, praiseworthy, whatever, you know whatever the idea is, if it's good, doesn't matter if it comes from a Stoic, you use it. Okay, we have five minutes left, and I have an entire section left. So we're gonna hit the highlights of this one. This is really cool, and I don't have very many slides for this. Uh, and this is more just like a, a semi-connected series of facts that are interesting. Uh, maybe a little bit less of a, an argument. So, everybody following me so far? You ready for a speed run here? Okay, uh, 
So Christ, salvation, and Caesar. So I have a question. So we have some, again, some like really important theological terms. Christ, salvation, uh, gospel. What are some of the others? Uh, Lord. What are the contexts of those words? Let, let's take Lord, for example. What's the context of Lord? Yeah, so that's the, the meaning, like just literally the head of a household could be a lord, right? It, you know, it, does, it, it could be a king, it could be the head of a household, it could be a slave's master. You know, it's a generic word. What's the context, though? Is there any wider context of that word? Why did Paul use that word? Yeah, so you have the Septuagint. What, what is the, the word lord, kurios, used for in the Septuagint? Yeah, so it's frequently used in the Septuagint to refer to God. So that's your first touch point. Interesting. What else? What else is that word Lord? Yeah. What about gospel? Okay, so there's maybe an imperial context there. What about salvation and savior? Yeah, so what's really interesting here is that a lot of the language that Paul very explicitly applies to Jesus in a very compact way is also applied very explicitly to Roman emperors. So uh, some of these terms we'll get through here. Um, This is a good example of where Paul is doing this, kind of the most compact uh, combination of all this language. Um, And uh, Jewish background, we'll skip through that for right now. So we already mentioned the whole kurios thing in the Septuagint. Again, we've we've pretty much all heard that. This is pretty common knowledge at this point. Um, But Paul's audience wasn't just Jewish. They were Gentiles in the Roman world. So what did they hear? So there's a whole bunch of interesting terms in Latin and Greek that are being applied to Augustus and then later to Nero, uh, Domitian, uh, etc., So this is a coin that shows uh, Augustus Caesar, and it is inscribed with uh, Augustus Divi uh, Divi Filius. What does Divi Filius mean? Anybody Latin Latin knowledgeable here? Yeah. So this is son of the divinized one because. You know, they asserted that Julius Caesar was divinized when he died, that he became a god, right? This was something that uh, Augustus, like, really pushed, um, was this divinization of Julius Caesar. Um, Now, so already, okay, son of the divinized one is kind of interesting. Translated into Greek, all of the nuance, because Augustus was very much not claiming to be a god, because he thought that would be a bridge too far. But when it gets translated to Greek, how do they translate it? Rather than some of, son of the div, uh, divinized one, they, call, they say son of the divine, or son of God, or God, son of God. So, uh, and this was, this is, uh, uh, in fact, actually I have... Um, this doesn't have the God, some son of God language in it. This is a decree from Asia, kind of the general area actually where, where Paul was from, um, declaring Augustus uh, the savior of the world and actually just, you know, decreeing that the year would now start on his birthday. Um, you'll notice the term glad tidings, gospel, uh, so, it, like, there's this very strong current of language associated with uh, the imperial uh, person and the imperial cult uh, that develops that is um, using this language, son of God, uh, salvation, um, gospel, uh, 
really ascribing this this very special role to the Caesars of being um, like the salvation of the world. Here's another an inscription where you can see uh, the the Divi Phyllis in there somewhere. Um, and we have this quote from N.T. Wright. He says, as far as I can discover, one extraordinary innovation uh, of the imperial claims of the Caesars was the production of a salvation history. This narrative, again, that is very much not that stoic idea, this uh, 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 kind of salvation history narrative rivaling something like what you would, you would see the Jews believing in. Um, that the Caesars created this, this idea uh, to kind of bolster their reputation in Rome, like this idea that there's this force of history pushing the, uh, you know, resulting in progress in the empire in some sense. Uh, but Paul subverts all of this, right? Because he applies those same terms to a man who was crucified by the Romans, like literally flips everything on its head. Um, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Savior. Jesus is Savior. Uh, Caesar is not the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. Uh, the good news is not from Caesar, it's from Christ. And then when, he, when, he, when Paul talks about the rulers and the authorities and the principalities and powers, he talks about human rulers and, and uh, spiritual uh, forces, Caesar is just kind of in there with everybody else. He's nothing special. He, so Paul is demoting Caesar to just another person, another, another ruler, principality, power uh, that gets lumped together. So he's kind of, he, he's radically lowering that status of Caesar. You see why people maybe were not too happy with Paul? Why he got brought before the Roman authorities so frequently? The, the claim that they were making to the Romans wasn't that he was like a bad Jew or that they're doing some weird religious thing. Everybody did weird religious things, like super weird religious things. Uh, the reason why the authorities cared is because what they were saying is that this is subversive. You know, they are not supporting the, emperor, uh, the empire. They're not worshiping uh, the emperor. They're not engaging in the, the society. And they're claiming that there is a, uh, a god that, uh, you know, a man that is uh, Lord, not Caesar. So now you can think of this overlap of this Jewish world and this Roman world. Okay, now, so why, what, what's Paul doing? When he's using the word kurios, is he referencing the Septuagint? Is he referencing, referencing language use of Caesar? Is he doing both? Is he doing something else? It's a little bit more complicated, right? Uh, but so you have to actually read uh, the context a little more. He's very clearly referencing all of those things in different ways, and it's complicated because he's a complicated person. And he has audiences that are both Jewish and Roman, right? Okay, wrapping up. Uh, so I said there were four worlds of Paul previously. How many worlds did we discuss? Three. I, I'm so surprised nobody called me on that back on that slide at the very beginning. Uh, so there is kind of a fourth world here, right? Uh, which is the Christian community that Paul is creating. Um, and I guess to leave you with thoughts, again, remember, this is just ramblings from me after spending a mind-numbing amount of time reading N.T. Wright, uh, which might have melted my brain a little bit, so take it with a grain of salt. But um, I think that when you start to think about how Paul is interacting with the, these worlds and what he's trying to do, it helps you understand his letters a little bit, Romans in particular. Um, if somebody could tell me in one sentence or two sentences, what is, what is Paul doing in Romans? Okay. So interesting that actually N.T. Wright would say he's, he's inventing Christian theology. What do you think? So if you had to write it out, probably, probably most of you wouldn't make too much of a reference to Jews and Gentiles. You'd focus on how you're saved or something like that, right? If you actually read Romans, like every other verse is something about 
Jews or Gentiles, Jews this, Gentiles that. A big part of what he's doing is focusing on the community. How do you have this community uh, that is mixed? How do you justify why, why the Gentiles belong there but shouldn't become Jews? Why the Jews still belong there? What is the unifying, uh, you know, the thing that holds them together? Um, what does it mean to be a member of that community uh, or not be a member of that community? And uh, it gives you a different flavor than if you think, oh, Romans is all about how I get to heaven, which is very much not what his primary goal is, right? Um, so anyway, uh, I just want you guys to think about that. What is Paul doing? What world is he living in? Uh, where is he trying to go and how all that fits together? And let that actually sink into your interpretation of the books. It's really hard in books like Romans because we have so much institutionalized um, and like just assumed theology, right? Um, so read the Into the Heart of Romans book. It's like very short and uh, it tells you lots of interesting things about just the chap. It's only about Romans 8. It's about one chapter. Um, but Wright talks about the ways you can think about Romans in Paul's context uh, instead of getting too sucked into uh, Martin Luther or John Calvin's context. So, Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, because it's kind of hard to make three overlapping things without those smaller overlapping things, without not using circles. And circles I can automatically make in Google Slides. 